the first nonconformist. John Hooper, one time Bishop of Gloucester in England, was burned at the stake in that city in 1555 during the reign of Mary. Only a few years before, in the time of King Edward, Hooper had made a resolute stand for truth, a stand which had a great impact on the course of the reformation of the Church of God in England, even though at the time it appeared that his firmness had failed to accomplish anything. Hooper dug his heels in over the issue of the nature and exercise of authority in the Church. Because of his attitude and stand, he is rightly being called the father of Puritanism, or the founder of nonconformity. Like William Tyndale before him, he was willing to defy the establishment, the king, church dignitaries, and parliament, in order to obey God. Hooper was not at all satisfied that the Church of England was sufficiently reformed, and he wanted to move it to a position closer to the New Testament even though this provoked the undisguised anger of the authorities. In effect, it made him a Puritan before their time, in that he demanded that the church be purified of various superstitions, hence the father of Puritanism. He refused to conform, at least for a while, hence the founder of nonconformity. Of course, the Anabaptists had long refused to conform to the state church. But by his stand for a purified church, Hooper made his own valuable contribution to the cause of Christ. He fought valiantly in the battle for the recovery of the New Testament pattern. Also, apart from the Anabaptists and their like, he was the first man after the Reformation in England to declare publicly that the state should not interfere with religion. John Hooper was born in Somerset in 1495. A papist from birth, he probably became a monk after graduating at Oxford in 1518, rising to become a courtier of King Henry VIII. He came to saving faith in Christ in part at least through reading the works of Zwingli and the commentary on Paul's letters by Johann Bullinger, Zwingli's successor at Zurich. Around the year 1539, Hooper's outspoken views brought Henry's wrath down upon him and he had to flee to the continent to escape persecution. The Church of England at that time had been partly reformed, but not enough for Hooper. It will be recalled that Henry, in the early 1520s, had burned Luther's works, and written against him. But by the end of the decade, the king had himself turned against Rome, removed Wolsey from power, and appointed Thomas Cranmer as Archbishop of Canterbury, Parliament, which assembled in November 1534, passed the Act of Supremacy, in which Henry was acknowledged to be the sole and supreme head on earth of the Church of England. The Act went on to grant Henry not only all the honours, jurisdictions and profits attached to that dignity, but also full authority to put down all heresies. What is more, whoever spoke or did anything contrary to this Act, whether concerning Henry or any of his heirs, was accounted guilty of high treason. Thus Henry threw off the papacy to become a virtual pope in England. Remaining a papist at heart, however, he introduced severe laws to enforce Romanism with rigor, and was prepared to put to death any who contradicted him. The infamous Act of Six Articles of 1539 imposed a death penalty by burning for those who denied popish dogmas such as the real presence of Christ in the Mass. This act has been aptly named the Whip with Six Strings. It was a whip which Henry was prepared to use with vigour. It was about this time that Hooper left England. All the same, God was working out his purpose in and through this trouble for Hooper, in that while, in exile on the continent, he met Bullinger and other reformers, and through these contacts he became more and more reformed in his thinking. Especially he came to appreciate the New Testament teaching on the church. In this way he began to see even more clearly that the Church of England needed to be thoroughly purged and purified according to Scripture. He stated his view in these words. The Scriptures are the law of God. None may set aside their commands or add to their injunctions. Christ's kingdom is a spiritual one. Neither the Pope nor King may govern the church. Christ alone is the governor of his church. 
The scripture and the apostles' churches are solely to be followed, and no man's authority. There is nothing to be done in the church, but is commanded by the word of God. On the death of Henry in 1547, Edward VI became king, and the friends of the Reformation cherished great hopes for the prosperity of the Church of England. Since a better day had dawned, Hooper knew it was his duty to return from exile and do all he could to further the cause of Christ in his own land. There was a favourable wind blowing over England, and now was the time to hoist the sails of the gospel. Accordingly, he arrived home shortly after Edward came to the throne, in order to help in the task of the further reformation of the church. Under the new king, some improvements were set in hand at once. An act of uniformity was passed in 1549, enforcing a complete system of worship for the Church of England, as contained in the Book of Common Prayer. Nevertheless, Hooper did not agree with certain aspects of this prayer book, and in his sermons, which were very popular and noted for biblical exposition, he drew attention to the imperfect state of the reformation of the church, and he called for more changes to get it closer to the New Testament. Preaching before King Edward, he asserted that the prayer book contained instructions with regard to vestments which were frankly contrary to Scripture. He bluntly stated that those responsible for it had no proper authority for these practices, saying they have not in the word of God that thus a minister should be apparelled, nor yet in the primitive and best church. Having thus declared what the pattern for the church is and where it may be found, he went on to demand that the primitive church be restored, which never had nor shall have any match or like. Let all movements and tokens of idolatry and superstition be removed, and the true religion of God be set in their place. He predicted that if wicked practices were tolerated in the church and excused by calling them things indifferent, they would eventually become things essential. Hooper was deeply distressed over the corrupt condition of the church and earnestly longed for the New Testament pattern to be restored. In 1550, he was nominated to become Bishop of Gloucester. But although he desired the position to enable him to put into practical effect his ideas to further the reformation of the church and to suppress vice and popery, he had no time to waste on footling ceremonies and foolish superstitions. They were more than stupid, they were sinful. But if he became a bishop, he would have to go through with the nonsense. All he wanted to do was get on with real work for God. Certainly the Diocese of Gloucester had need of him. In a survey which Hooper carried out, he found that it had 311 clergy, 168 of whom did not know the Ten Commandments, and 31 of these could not find them in the Bible. 40 did not know where to find the Lord's Prayer, so called, 31 of whom did not know who had instructed the disciples to pray in this way. Even so, much as Hooper wanted to advance the cause of God, he was not willing to do evil in the hope that good might come, however great that good might be. He was convinced that the wearing of vestments was contrary to Scripture, and he knew that if he consented to be consecrated Bishop of Gloucester, he would have to compromise himself, wear the obnoxious garb, and thus offend his conscience. For this reason, he resisted stoutly. Hooper was prepared to quarrel over the issue, even with his distinguished friends, Archbishop Cranmer and Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of London. Hooper had further complaints to make, raising several other objections to the prayer book service. He protested against the taking of an oath which involved the invocation of the saints. He objected to the performance of various superstitious ceremonies, like the parading of the Bible on his shoulders, for example and he rejected sundry nonsensical regulations about the exact way to carry the Bible or hold the elements in the Lord's Supper. All this sort of palaver was highly offensive to him because it was either contrary to Scripture or additional to it. Either way, he would have no part in such a service. But Hooper's main objection was over the ministerial vestments in use in the Church of England. Among the arguments which he used against the garments, he asserted that the vestments were leftovers from the Levitical priesthood of Aaron, and based upon it. Since that priesthood had been abolished by Christ, 
the priestly vestments likewise have been abolished in the gospel. Hence it is a sin to use them. He quoted Galatians 3 and Hebrews chapter 7 to 10 and reasoned, The doctrine of Paul is this, that whosoever recalls things abrogated in Christ transgresses the will of God. The priesthood of Aaron has been abolished in the priesthood of Christ, with all its rites, vestments, unctions, consecrations and the like. The shadows of the Aaronic priesthood cannot consist with the priesthood of Christ. He went on to argue that the Church of England vestments were papistical garments and therefore belonged to the Antichrist, not to the Church. He declared that Rome was quite open about the origin of the Popish priesthood, which even by the testimony of their own books had been derived from Aaron or from the Gentiles. Rome clearly and unashamedly admitted that its vestments were either Aaronic or pagan. Hooper argued, therefore, that since the Church of England had inherited her ministerial apparel from Rome, then she must have a popish priesthood too. Consequently, the Church of England had an Aaronical or even pagan priesthood, unless the vestments were done away with. No church which wished to be New Testament in doctrine and practice could possibly tolerate the popish priesthood or anything belonging to it. Hence, unless the vestments were abolished, he would not consent to be made Bishop of Gloucester. It was a vital matter of principle with him. In the summer of 1550, King Edward grew deeply concerned over the delay. He very much wanted Hooper as a bishop, so he struck out the offending words in the oath with his own hand. All the same, the question of vestments remained. Nicholas Ridley had been a firm friend of John Hooper over the years, and the pair of them had worked together to reform the state church. For instance, Ridley had valued and made use of Hooper's preaching gift on important occasions, but now the two men were in direct conflict over the vestments. Ridley did not agree with Hooper, to put it mildly. Thomas Cranmer too strongly opposed Hooper, and warned him of legal action against him if he persisted in his objections to the garments. Actually, Cranmer and Ridley were guilty of hypocrisy at this time. In the summer of 1550, they had consecrated one Thomas Sampson as a priest without his wearing vestments, and Sampson had protested on exactly the same grounds as Hooper. But Hooper was a well-known figure who was to be consecrated the Bishop of Gloucester, not merely an obscure priest. That made all the difference. Notwithstanding the threat of legal action hanging over him, Hooper was adamant he would not consent. Therefore the authorities tried another approach. They told Cranmer he could break the rules with impunity, that he would be granted a royal pardon if he went ahead and consecrated Hooper without vestments. Despite this legal device handed down from on high, it was Ridley's turn to dig his heels in. He would not hear of it. It was out of the question. Hooper was defying the law. He must not be allowed to get away with it. The law of the king, the church, and parliament must be obeyed, even by Hooper, especially by Hooper. Ridley went further. Fighting back against his former friend, he took up the challenge of Hooper's arguments and attempted a response. He did not agree that the wearing of vestments was simple. It was a thing indifferent, he said. It was not a question of scripture at all. It was a question of the laws of England. Hooper was disobeying the regulations of King Edward. Addressing the council, Ridley demanded, I pray you, who has appointed now and instituted our vestments in the Church of England? And who has established them? Has not the Archbishop with his company of learned men thereunto appointed by the King his Highness and his Majesty's council appointed them? Has not the King, his Majesty, and the whole Parliament established them? This statement of Ridley's was of the utmost significance, standing in sharp contrast to the words of Hooper. It showed very clearly that the issue in question was not merely a few garments, it was authority. That was the crux of it, authority. To Hooper, the governance in the church, as in all things, was God's mind declared in Scripture. To Ridley, at least on this issue, it was the king, the church, and the whole parliament which constituted the authority. Instead of Scripture, it was the company of learned men for him. Their regulations were the rule. It was nothing but Constantine all over again. 
and Hooper's stance forced it out into the open. Typical of the consequences of the mistaken but commonly held union of church and state, the king and his council were constantly framing and reframing laws, enforcing ministers to wear red habits by some on some days, and white and black habits by others on other days, changing the laws themselves within two years, and burning, hanging, or imprisoning all those who could not change their consciences as fast as the rulers could theirs. It was a farce, apart from the horrible price it exacted in blood. And what was happening in the country while all this was going on? What good did all the regulation-making do? What contribution did it make to the advance of the gospel? None for immorality flourished like a green bay tree. Nevertheless, the regulations continued to multiply, and so did the sin. Martin Bucer described the condition of the country, saying that lying, cheating, theft, perjury, and whoredom are the complaints of the times. Bucer, the reformer from Strasbourg, was now Regius Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, and his words carried great weight with Edward and his advisers. He had taught Calvin in the formative days at Strasbourg, and his liturgy shaped that which was introduced to Geneva, and thence to Scotland. And what did Bucer propose to deal with the wickedness of the people? Foolishly, like other reformers, he turned back to Constantine to produce a manual of Christian politics, to show the Christian king how he might thereby establish the kingdom of Christ in England. Sparing no pains, his system's outlines were sharpened and his details elaborated with all the remorseless precision of a devotee of Constantine. And this was the atmosphere in which Hooper was making his stand on vestments. It was the way the overwhelming majority felt in those days. The question boiled down to one of authority. Is the king to be obeyed simply because he is a king? Does he have the power and the right to regulate the church? Ridley thought so, in everything. Hooper staunchly disagreed. In matters of religion, he would obey God rather than men. Ridley went on to warn the council that Hooper was playing with fire, literally, by his obstinacy. Because if he continued in this vein, he would end up an Anabaptist, and nothing could be worse than that. Since 1549, Edward had made use of a commission to root out Anabaptists and others who spurned the prayer book. If such heretics could not be reclaimed, their ultimate end was death by the civil authorities, having been handed over to their power by the church. Ridley even had some cautionary words for the king himself, advising him to watch his step in his dealings with the prospective Bishop of Gloucester. He said, let his highness take good heed with his doings. It looks as though Ridley was afraid that the king would be too lenient with the rebel. Throughout, Ridley was very much committed to his authoritarian view. Some historians think he altered his opinion at the last, but it is probably not so. It is true that he wrote sympathetically to Hooper when he, Ridley, was awaiting his own execution, and it is also true that he resisted the attempt by the papists to degrade him, wearing his vestments when he reached his own end. But it is likely that neither of these facts means that he really changed his mind on the wearing of vestments in accordance with the laws of Parliament and Church. The ideas of Constantine were too deeply ingrained in him. Ridley now tried another tack. If Hooper would drop his assertion that vestments were sinful, then he, Ridley, would consecrate him wearing anything he liked, even that old coat Hooper always wore. But Hooper still would not budge. Vestments were sinful. They were forbidden by Scripture, and that was that. He would not be moved. Cranmer consulted some of the Continental Reformers over the matter, all of whom, with one exception, sided with him against Hooper. In any event, even if Hooper knew of this, it did not affect him, and still he refused to change his mind. He did not give in just because the majority were against him. The quarrel grew bitter, and was prolonged. 
the authorities offered this so-called difficult man a tempting compromise. If only he would agree to be consecrated in the vestments, he need never wear them any more, except for some special occasions. Hooper once again refused. Going further, he preached about it, much to the embarrassment of the authorities, who wanted this annoying quarrel hushed up. Hooper defied their orders. He would not keep silent. He would preach. And on the 20th of December, 1550, he actually went into print and published his confession of faith. For this so-called insolence, he was placed under house arrest at Lambeth Palace and was warned of grave consequences if he went on with his refusals. Hooper still would not yield, even though some of the continental reformers who were in England at the time came to see him and talked it over with him. Finally, the powers that be ran out of patience. On the 27th of January, 1551, the Privy Council committed him to the Fleet Prison for his obstinacy. Here is yet another challenge to us. Hooper put adherence to Scripture above loyalty to his friends. He would not be moved, no, neither by threat nor by flattery. How is it with you? Do you want to be thought popular? Do you yield on your loyalty to Scripture because of taunts, sneers, or mockery from those about you? Surely you find that this account of Hooper stands on what was called a small matter is a challenge to you. How often gospel principles are compromised by professing Christians today. In the light of Hooper's previous resolution, it is very sad to have to record that despite all the months of steadfast determination and refusal to be moved either by inducement or by threat, after a month in the fleet, Hooper gave way. In all fairness, it must be said that it was not through lack of courage that Hooper gave in. Courage Hooper always had, and he would display it in even larger measure within a few years when he would be burned at the stake. No, cowardice was not the reason. The reason he yielded was that he persuaded himself that he ought to do what he could for the further reformation of the church. It was his duty. From his debates with Cranmer and Ridley over vestments, he knew they would not go far enough or fast enough in putting matters right. Either they could not see the issues, or they would not face up to them. Therefore he must get out of prison and do what he could. For this reason, he consented to wear the miserable vestments and be consecrated as Cranmer and Ridley wanted, in order to get out of prison and get on with the real task. He was duly consecrated on the 8th of March, 1551. Even so, it is proper to wonder if this was the right decision. Did he not go back on his first resolve, even though he continued to maintain that his thoughts about Cranmer and Ridley and their lack of discernment were justified? And was not his first resolve the right one? Was it not a case of doing a little evil, that much good may be done after all? In addition, it is undeniable that if only Hooper had maintained his stance just a little longer, he would have seen his arguments largely put into effect. He had accomplished more than he realized by his obstinacy. Just over a year after Hooper's release from the fleet, the second prayer book of King Edward was published, and this abolished the ritual of the ordination service to which he had taken such exception. More than that, most of the offensive vestments were done away with, not all, but most. The second book was certainly a great advance upon the first, if only Hooper had held out. Do you not feel that this may serve as a warning to you? What is your reaction to this sad episode? With the passage of 450 years, this grievous quarrel between friends may appear to be trivial. For many of today's Christians, it's a tempest in a thimble, not worth the repeating. Doubtless, some might even argue that it's wrong to drag it up once more. Yet that view would be grievously mistaken. 
There was a very serious and important issue at stake in the quarrel at that time, and this issue would come up time and again in the next eighty years. Indeed, the issue is always relevant. It matters today and to today's Christians. Or it ought to. It ought to concern you. What was the issue? The position taken by Cranmer and Ridley over the vestments was that the whole thing was poultry and a footling quarrel. They thought Hooper should have realised that smaller points were not to be worried about. It was the larger point that had to be grasped. He ought to have kept the big issue in mind. Vestments were a matter indifferent. It was the preaching of the gospel that counted. That was the important thing. Compromise was justified. Hooper profoundly disagreed. He knew what popish vestments would lead to. Compromise would mean that in the end the gospel would be smothered by popery. But his main argument was that scripture must determine what is done in the church in every respect, and that the New Testament is God's mind on the matter, revealed once and for all. The Bible is the authority, the sole authority, in all aspects of the church, in all aspects, for all time. Cranmer and Ridley replied that things must be allowed to develop or progress in the church, that additions to and deviations from Scripture are allowable as things indifferent, that the church itself can decide in such matters, and that the magistrates have the power to enforce such decisions as laws. And if the magistrate prescribes a law, the citizen must obey it. Every citizen, including Hooper. This remains the point at issue. Authority. What is the authority in the church? Hooper realized the importance of the matter. Furthermore, other vital questions come from it. For instance, what is the church? How can we find out? What is the church's pattern? Who are the members of the church? Are they members merely because they are citizens of a so-called Christian country? In other words, Hooper was not simply dealing with the question of vestments, but he was raising the same controversy which had already been raised in Zurich in 1525 by the Anabaptists. He did not realize it, perhaps, but that is what it was. It was the Constantine question, all over again, in another form. Christ is the king of his church, and he rules it by his word in scripture. No pope, monarch, politician, or magistrate has the say. Ponder again Hooper's words quoted earlier. They state the issue very clearly. He said, The scriptures are the law of God. None may set aside their commands or add to their injunctions. Christ's kingdom is a spiritual one. Neither the pope nor king may govern the church. Christ alone is the governor of his church. The scripture and the apostles' churches are solely to be followed, and no man's authority. There is nothing to be done in the church, but is commanded by the word of God. Was Hooper not right when he predicted that if non-biblical things are allowed and justified on the grounds that they are things indifferent, then they will eventually become things essential? Without doubt he was right. Who can question it? Hooper was far-sighted and could see the evil consequences of allowing anything contrary to Scripture to remain in the church. In his case, the thing which he saw to be wrong was especially the question of vestments. He argued that the Church of England must be totally reformed according to the word of God, that the work during Henry's reign had only started the Reformation, and it was still incomplete in Edward's time. But the principle applies to every aspect of the church, and it applies today. It is highly significant that Ridley also saw future developments quite clearly, in spite of himself. He gave the game away when, as already noted in his words to the council, he warned Hooper that his stance could only lead to one end, Anabaptism. Exactly so. That was the issue. That was the battleground. I repeat, the great question was, what is the authority in the church? Hooper defied the authority of the state and wanted to obey only scripture. He reached thousands by his preaching. 
and he told them bluntly that their consciences were not bound by men, but by the word of God only. By the use of scripture, he said, men have the right to judge bishop, doctor, preacher, and curate. In his writings, he declared that the laws of the civil magistrate are not to be admitted into the church. All this was in direct contradiction of Ridley, who urged Hooper to obey the laws of England. Hooper refused. He said he would obey only the law of God, which is the Bible. Hooper was right. Ridley was wrong. What is the authority in the church for you? Is it tradition? Is it custom? Is it parliament? Is it society? Is it the Pope? Is it what you like doing? Or is it the only authority? The Bible.